I'm going to be describing some algorithmic and numerical tricks that we've done to both let us do larger systems, improve the statistical accuracy of our method, and also actually work on improving the fundamental approximations uh, on the method. Outline of this talk is, is really very simple. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the motivations for our work, you know, why we're going to go through all this trouble. Touch on Quantum Monte Carlo at a really a, a very high level. Uh, I have slides uh, for days, so if you're interested in more uh, details, we can talk in the, the rest of the workshop and questions at the end. And then the main core of this talk is going to be on, on three areas where we've made some progress, and I'm also going to point out some uh, open questions. And I picked the first two because, uh, on uh, both uh, new numerical algorithms and also mapping to uh, GPUs because they're very simple, uh, have been proven to be very effective, and I hope will also provide some food for thought for other algorithms because I think they can provide some, uh, they can be used elsewhere. And then finally, I'm going to talk about some work actually improving fundamental approximations in our methods, so improving the fixed node approximation uh, as it's called. And I'm not really going to have time to describe all the details. That would be far too much. So I'm basically going to state the problem sort of like as a, as a confession as to where we are and then ask for help. So if anyone has any suggestions, I, I'm very, uh, very interested in them as this is one of the keys for progress in the field uh, going forward. And before we get to all of that, I need to thank all of my um, co-authors and uh, collaborators. Uh, and uh, I'm very fortunate to uh, lead a uh, DOE Basic Energy Sciences Computational Material Sciences Center. Uh, and this is our um, you know, group picture from uh, October of last year. We've got people at Sandia, Argonne, NC State, and Brown here. And you know, our goal is to uh, you know, advance quantum Monte Carlo methods. Uh, have them actually instantiated in the QMC pack code, which is you know, fully open source, fully openly developed. You can see what we're doing uh, up on GitHub. Uh, and then, of course, also do some science uh, with it as well. So, for example, this uh, group actually includes some experimentalists, so experimental validation was actually required as part of this uh, project. So we also use you know, the full suite of other electronic structure methods, and we fully expect to be doing that going forward using each method for its particular niche advantages. Uh, and then also not shown here, um, also part of the DOE Exascale um, computing project, we've been working on uh, performance portability. And I particularly want to um, thank uh, Yalo, who's somewhere at the, the back here, of Argonne National Lab, and Peter Doak at Oak Ridge, who's who actually not pictured, who came up with some of the architectural changes that we've now got uh, implemented. So, you know, what is the motivation here? Well, there's, there's many ways of motivating this work. Uh, sometimes it's getting the qualitative physics correct, and other times, of course, it is just improved quantitative accuracy. So this first case, I want to call out the challenge of, of quantum materials, where actually for some materials, it's actually still a challenge to get qualitatively the correct uh, result. So, you know, these materials are, of, are of, of interest because of their properties that emerge because of you know, complex couplings between uh, where the atoms are moving, where the, where the electrons go, and also the role of magnetism uh, in the material, as well as symmetry and so on. And those same interactions, which give rise to interesting properties, also make them hard to model with really any approach. And the problem we find, of course, is that standard approaches are sometimes qualitatively incorrect. And the real issue is we don't always know when that actually is. And that's the problem if you're trying to do predictive science. If the material hasn't been synthesized, you've got no data, uh, that's a problem. And it isn't just us uh, saying this. So this is actually a sort of a request to the, the community. Uh, so apologies for all the words, uh, words here, but I wanted to have the full quote. So you know, in a recent review on magnetic topological materials uh, in nature, um, Bernovig, Felser, and Bidenkoff actually made what I felt was a very interesting appeal. Now, of course, Bernovig and, and Felser have done a lot of work developing a very popular, uh, very successful database of proposed quantum materials. But then in this review, they actually call out for more experimental work, including neutron scattering, to determine the magnetic structure of these materials. And that's because they would like to use it as essentially a constraint 
for the methods that are being used on the theory and simulation side. So in other words, the methods that we're using today, which you know, tend to be pulled out of this soup of density functional approximations, aren't as good as we would like. So we would like better methods. Now, of course, there's other reasons why we might want to uh, have more accurate methods uh, and widely applicable methods uh, available. And I thought I'd pull on, on something that's sort of been in the news recently. Uh, and that's the, the, the propo proposed uh, new high temperature superconductors. And clearly, this is an example of a very important topic where we'd like to use the highest quality ab initio methods that are available to try and arrive at some consensus. And so just to note a little bit of, of the history here, so you know, a couple of years ago, there was actually a nature cover uh, with you know, ex um, experimental claims that in a carbonaceous sulfur hydride, this particular system would be superconducting actually at room temperature. So that's the real surprise. And, uh, but nevertheless, at quite high pressures. And the interesting thing, of course, is that looking at the citations of this work in the development of the field, a lot of the interest in the hydrides can be traced back to density functional predictions, noting that this is actually a uh, system that's sort of ripe for superconductivity. This is actually electron phonon mediated superconductivity. And then, of course, most recently, and this made the New York Times, of course, there was evidence uh, claimed in. Uh, nitrogen-doped lutetium hydride. And just as a reminder, lutetium is often here on the periodic table, um, here on, on, on this one. Uh, so a very different system to the first. Uh, here with room temperature superconductivity claimed at actually a much lower pressure, 10 kilobar. Uh, and of course, adding to the, uh, the intrigue here, of course, is that this first paper was redrawn by the editors of Nature over some data processing issues. So hopefully this will, will turn out for the best, but clearly this is an area where, let's just say we've been receiving emails, if we could do some uh, high-end uh, calculations. So that then brings me to uh, Ab initio Quantum Monte Carlo, which I'm just going to sketch uh, out here. So this is actually commonly said to be the sort of most accurate general approach for solving Schrodinger's equation for real materials. And what do we mean by general? Well, it can work on metals, insulators, you can do molecules. Uh, we're not restricted to uh, high symmetry primitive cells and materials, for example, so you can do defects, interfaces, uh, and so on. So there's a, a broad generality there, so you're not stuck on a lattice for example. And then of particular interest is that the methods, and there are a number, don't have many approximations in them. We know what they are, and they are at least all in principle testable. And then this actually sets up the potential for being able to spend more computer time and getting steadily more accurate results. And we certainly like a theory that could do that. Uh, of course, the problem is, or the trade-off here, is that to get this increased accuracy, we're going to have to spend a lot more on the computational side. Now, there's a lot of quantum Monte Carlo methods. They've all got their pluses and minuses. In this talk, we're mainly using real space diffusion quantum Monte Carlo. And you know, why are we interested in this? Why does most of our time go to using this method? Well, it's a projection method. And what that means is that we can, we can input a, a trial wave function, which we've got some, some other method, the best one that we can possibly get hold of. So it could be from multi-reference couple cluster if we can get the wave function for that, or it could just be from hartley fock or density functional theory, which is sort of the standard that's done. And the way the method works is there's a realization that if you write the time-dependent Schrodinger equation in imaginary time, we get this, this PDE, which everyone in this room knows how to solve, right? This is just an, exp this is just an exponential. And then if you put in a, a set of uh, energy ordered, uh, ordered eigenstates and evolve in time, the high energy ones are going to disappear exponentially quicker than the ground state, leaving you just the ground state, provided you take care to renormalize and do some bookkeeping uh, like that. So that means then that the results are not so dependent on what you input, and you can get greater accuracy, maybe find something you didn't think of. The key approximation here, a very famous one that I've already mentioned, is that in order to make this non-exponential, in fact cubic, as we're going to be discussing, and uh, actually have the right symmetries, meaning actually a fermionic wave function, 
uh, we have to make an approximation, and that is we freeze the zeros of the wave function, so the nodes of the wave function, at those of our input trial wave function. Now, that sounds very severe, and it is, but it introduces only a variational approximation, variational in the energy. And of course, when one has a variational principle, as we've been hearing throughout the week, you can at least in principle set up an optimization scheme. And that's actually what the community is increasingly uh, doing. So if we just did the sort of the standard approach where we uh, take a wave function from density functional theory, for example, and don't work to really improve it very much, how accurate is this out of the box? And of course, this is just a quick sketch to, to give you an idea. Uh, this is some work done by Juan Santana a few years ago, and I, I, I quite like these graphs that he built up, looking at a range of materials, obviously building up doing, to doing cuprate superconductors. And what's shown here, if we look at this top plot, this is the error in, I think it's the formation enthalpy for a range of materials, calcium oxide on the left, lanthanum oxide uh, on the right. And so this is the error in the, error in the uh, energy here, and the red is the diffusion Monte Carlo results. You see it's, it's very small. Uh, and it, and the, for this particular set of systems, you know, this is how these other bars are how different density functional uh, approximations come out. And of course, if we had different materials, this would look uh, differently. Maybe the DFT would be better. But generally, the DMC is very accurate on the energy. Now, what happens if we look at the lattice constant? Or well, here, if we look at the, the red, we see that actually things aren't quite so perfect. Right, and actually as we move to heavier systems, we see a growing error. Right, what might this be due to? Well, there's actually not many approximations that this could be uh, due to. Uh, it's, this needs to be revisited, but most likely it's the error from the trial wave function. Also, since this work was done in 2016, it doesn't use sort of our latest pseudopotentials. So this perhaps could be an issue for lanthanum, although it wouldn't be an issue for calcium. So what are people doing uh, in the field? Uh, this is a very biased selection of results because they're all done with uh, QMC pack, but I think they're still somewhat representative. So here on the left, uh, this is a publication by um, uh, Dan Starus looking at chromium triiodide, first claimed uh, single layer magnet. And the significance of this work is that the geometry is fully optimized within quantum Monte Carlo. So the geometry is not from DFT or experiment, and conveniently, while this was being done, some microscopy came out, and the QMC has the best agreement with the micro that particular microscopy experiment. Here in the, uh, in the middle, uh, we have some work on the hydrogen phase diagram from David Seppoli and co-workers, as they've done path integral molecular dynamics with a machine learned potential. And the significance is that the data for the training, the energy and forces, is from quantum Monte Carlo. And finally, here on the right, I wanted to include a, a, a chemistry or molecular uh, result. Uh, this is, again, looking at, this is actually looking at over 1,000 molecules used for machine learned uh, training. Uh, and so we have a script, it's quite a crude script, that runs these 1,000 uh, molecules. So it's starting to be possible to do higher throughput QMC calculations. Of course, there's a lot that needs to be done here to build out a whole electronic structure theory. Uh, of course, the applicability we've got, but you know, we need to work on uh, improving the approximations. Uh, we actually need to show that right, we can steadily work across the entire uh, periodic table. So over the last couple of years, we've got spin orbit uh, implemented, for example. I'm going to touch on this talk, the mapping to uh, GPU systems, because that's the way uh, computer hardware is developing for the energy savings that are realized. And actually, there's a lot of areas where people contrib can contribute in terms of new properties, for example. And of course, it's also very important that we make connections with other theories so we can use different methods for their individual strengths. Uh, so that brings me on to this point uh, in the talk. And I now want to talk about some advances in our numerical uh, algorithms. So let's start by thinking, where do the computational costs in the method uh, come from? And we're going to look at the cost of computing the ratio of the wave function with one electron moved, R prime. Right? That's actually the, we have to evaluate this during the Monte Carlo. And there are lots of other properties that have similar ratios like this coming in. 
So the trick, of course, in Monte Carlo is to make this very fast and efficient. And the key trick that I'm going to uh, touch upon here has actually been standard for uh, 40 years, since you know, at least 1977, uh, uh, is that we're going to store an inverse of a determinant and update it using the Sherman-Morrison uh, algorithm. Right? N cubed is going to come from this. So how do we get to that? Well, we have a, a fairly standard trial wave function form, which you know, consists of some, some, uh, some, some product of determinants. And if we had hartree fock there would just be one here. And then we have some sort of correlation function, some Jastro function on the right. And the key challenge is to be able to comp actually compute the ratio of the determinants, since this is the most expensive piece. And if we computed uh, the inverse of the value of a determinant from scratch, that would, of course, be cubic. Uh, for every time we touch this, and we want to be more efficient, of course. So, you know, what are the costs here? Well, when, when we're doing this evaluation, we do need to compute the new row of this or column of this determinant. So we need to evaluate these hartree fock orbitals, let's say. Well, that's going to be order n or maybe n squared, depending on the basis set that we're using. You have lots of freedom of choice in this method. Uh, and then if we have the inverse of the determinant stored, which in the literature is always called A tilde, I find this confusing, but um, th this is what you'll find uh, in, the, in the literature. If we have the inverse, it turns out that you can just get the ratio as a dot product. So that's very convenient. The challenge then is to update the inverse. Unfortunately, there is a, a well-known textbook algorithm for this, Sherman-Morrison algorithm. You'll find it in Golub matrix comp computations on Wikipedia and, and so on. Uh, and this lets us up update the inverse with n squared cost. So we move one electron, accept it, and then we can update that inverse with n squared cost. And so this is the Sherman-Morrison form, and also an early uh, QMC developer, Stephen Fahey, a lot of important contributions, actually has a slight rewrite of this, which lets us store slightly less, still n squared. If we then sweep to the whole determinant, that's how we get to our cube. So then how does that perform? So what, I, what I'm showing here uh, is results for a calculation on nickel oxide, a large growing supercell of nickel oxide. The details of that don't really matter. It's the electron count uh, that matters. And so what I'm showing here is the actual, you know, where we spent fraction of time in the application. So this is sort of a profile against uh, atom count. And uh, since this is nickel oxide, when we have about 1,000, a, a 100 atoms, we're over 1,000 uh, electrons. So where do we spend our time? Well, you can see that as we go to larger systems, this purple starts taking ever more time. This is the updating of the inverse. And uh, we see you know, for the largest, over 95% of the runtime will be there using this algorithm. OK, why is that? Well, essentially, this operation, in addition to being cubic overall, uh, or n squared on one election, runs very inefficiently on standard hardware, particularly CPU hardware. Uh, why is that? Well, it, relative to the amount of computation it does, it does quite a lot of reading and writing to memory. So that's not healthy. And then in addition, for these larger runs, we actually drop out of cache on CPU. So there is a huge hit when that happens. So that's what people have done for many years. How do we do better? And this is actually very simple. But I want to point out it's slightly counterintuitive. What we're going to do is increase the number of operations that we're doing. We might more than double the number of operations we do in this cubic part. But nevertheless, the replacement is going to be so much more efficient, it's worth doing. So think about that for your algorithms. And the basic idea here is that instead of updating the inverse every move, we're going to delay for a while. Uh, and as we accept moves or reject them, we're going to use the generalized Sherman-Morrison-Woodbury formula to get the ratio, which lets us do multi-column changes. And then after we've gone for a while, then we're going to do one big update. So. The algorithm for this is actually fairly straightforward. It looks very, the algebra actually looks very similar to the, the earlier algebra. There is a one little trick here that we had to uh, come up with, uh, but it actually turns out, so it turns out there's a little work matrix you need, the inverse of, but we can actually avoid taking the inverse and actually grow it as we go through this uh, delay procedure. Um, and so then 
uh, once, we once we've sort of made this realization, of course, it's quite a bit of plumbing to get this into your code, uh, which we have that. Um, you know, everything I'm talking about in this talk is actually in mainline QMC pack that you can uh, run today. Um, so then how does it perform? So this is, I should say, we're not even going to do the, the profile initially. This is the speed of the whole run. And then here vertically, I hope this is sufficiently readable at the back, uh, this is the speed up of the run. A question then? Yeah, so, so the delay is really uh, uh, this Sherman Morrison part is to compute the ratio of the term. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. So as you delay, is that possible? This, uh, 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 this acceptance rate also becomes... Uh, so we, don't, we do not change the, the Monte Carlo at all in this procedure. This is purely numerical trickery. Oh, because you keep track of the history. Yes, so we, keep track, we keep track so of the history. Yes. Still computing the ratio of the two rows. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And also the, the operations count is a little tricky to get as well because it, we have to touch the wave function at several points in the algorithm. So depending on how many wave function dependent properties are measured, the cost is going to change. So we just have to implement it and see how well it works. So the Metropolis Hastings acceptance rules still. Yeah, but we don't, yeah, exactly, we do, but we don't change it. So for example, in our tests, it's exactly the same test values, whatever delay we're using. All right, so this is the uh, actually speed up relative to Sherman Morrison run against the number of delays. And actually, this is probably easier if I, I point against varying system size. So this green is the result for 128 nickel oxide uh, atoms, and we see here that it's actually more than doubled the speed of the entire run. And then if we go up to this largest one, uh, which is for 1,000 nickel oxide uh, atoms or 6,000 electrons of each spin, we see we have more than an order of magnitude improvement in the runtime of the whole application. So this is really a huge speed up. A uh, number of other things we can see here actually is, you know, we look at the shape of the speed up curves against the number of delays. Delays of 16, 32, 64 sort of seem to suffice here. And of course, if we delay for too much, actually the performance starts to come down because we start being bitten by this extra work that we're doing uh, in this procedure. So that's CPUs. Uh, actually, we have a little bit more here. So I can, we can actually see how this then has changed the overall breakdown of time in the application. So that previous purple bar, which was up here, is now down, taking 25% of the time, and we see just one kernel of many uh, in the application. Uh, now, what now about GPU performance? Well, we do get a, a speed up here, but it is not as much. So what's shown here is the number of delays, and we've got two runs. Um, so this purple is a 3,000 electron run, and it's roughly doubled the uh, throughput of the application. And this 768 uh, electron run, we maybe got 30% faster. So uh, very nice uh, to have. Uh, not as much as on CPUs. Of course, what might ask the question is why is that? Well, of course, we have much more memory bandwidth to play with on the GPUs uh, to start with. So the algorithm has never been quite as starved as on uh, CPUs. I do think we might be able to make some more optimization uh, here, but this is what we're using as default in production uh, right now. So just to sort of summarize this little part of the talk, we have, we have this huge acceleration um, with this uh, method, and we actually have a couple of outstanding questions. So I was just wanting to, to, to clarify, so the speed up is basically because you're able to take a whole chunk of data and run it very efficiently rather than doing lots of little bits. Is that the key idea? Yeah, so maybe I skip this slightly, slightly too far. Um, so quickly. So, you know, when we look at these operations that we're now doing, right, these are all now uppercase letters for the most part, which are matrices and not vectors. So we have transitioned to, to BLAS3 operations and matrix matrix operations. And matrix matrix operations are basically the most efficient thing you can do on, on modern hardware. And, you know, even this laptop I have in front of me has got matrix accelerators on it. So that capability is, is quite widespread. So, so it's just... Woodbury instead, the gen generalization of uh, Sherman Morrison in Woodbury. Woodbury. It, it's generalized Sherman Morrison, one little trick to uh, avoid you know, re-computing re uh, one matrix uh, too frequently. And then of course the logic in the Monte Carlo to make sure we do not actually change the Monte Carlo. So there's quite a bit of plumbing behind this. 
And we do have some additional outstanding questions. So this, of course, only accelerates a single determinant wave function. Uh, there's a whole additional theory in line of algorithms on multi-determinant algorithms that I'm not going to touch on uh, in this talk, but obviously we'd like to combine these uh, in, in some way if that's possible. And also, um, you know, QMC pack can use mixed precision, you can use single, you can use double in sort of any combination that you would like. Uh, but this is actually a slightly numerically unstable technique, even to Sherman Morrison 1. And the way we normally de deal with that is to just recompute the matrices from scratch every so often. And we'd like to be more sophisticated than that. This isn't a very user friendly uh, feature. Uh, so the question is you know, can we do that in a smarter way? And also, can we add some kind of correction step? to our single, part, single precision results to avoid the full recompute. And there is some math that suggests we could do that. All right, so topic two. And this is about the mapping to heterogeneous supercomputers. Uh, so we've got fewer equations here. So the question, of course, is how do we exploit these, these GPUs? And there are some fundamental challenges for us. So porting real space to QMC to GPUs is not the most straightforward. And the basic reason is that we might only have 100 electrons or maybe 10,000 electrons. And so we can't necessarily rely that the user wants to run a very, very large system with lots of electrons. Um, just because the system, a molecule has got 100 electrons in it, for example, doesn't mean it's important. If someone wants to compute a property to very high accuracy of a small molecule, we want to be able to handle that. So we can't rely on there being lots of electrons. And then if we you know, look at the, what's on uh, exascale type generation GPUs from all the three vendors, they have about 10,000 or so streaming multiprocessors on them, or the, well, the equivalent from each vendor is calling, on, calling them. And that means we need at least that many operations in flight, preferably 100 times more than that, maybe 1,000 times more than that, so maybe a million operations in flight. That's an awful lot more than 100. Adding to this, of course, we can't ignore GPUs. Um, 16 of the top 20 supercomputers on top 500 have got GPUs. So actually, it's becoming easier to count the computers that don't have <laughs> accelerators. I should say, as an aside, I'm not going to talk about parallel scalability in this talk. We, we've, we've got that handle. And of course, in addition, you know, we want to be able to make sure we run on all the different vendor GPUs. So what do we do? Uh, so let's look at you know, a canonical quantum Monte Carlo algorithm. This is very straightforward. Probably we've all written something like this in some numerical methods course. Uh, so what do we have? We have some sort of time-stepping loop in which we're going to be moving our electrons in this case, not, not, um, not atoms. Uh, then we're going to have some loop over what we call walkers, but really Markov chains. And then inside that, we're going to have a loop over electrons. And we, here we're going to do the things you'd expect. We're going to propose moving an electron. We're going to compute that wave function ratio that I, I spoke about, square it to get an acceptance probability, measure an energy, uh, these sorts of things. And of course, the gotcha here is that the amount of numerical work at this low level is you know, order n, order n squared, and n is already too small. Uh, so just mapping this to GPUs in a naive way will not be successful. It does work very well on multi-core systems, though. Now, we actually have a previous approach, um, this batching approach I'm going to describe, which we actually have been using for actually about a decade now, so to GPUs. Uh, actually aren't new to us. And the basic idea was to batch or group together the updates of all the Markov chains on any one particular GPU that we're running on. So what does this look like in the algorithm? Well, we're going to have you know, m walkers per GPU. We now have a time step loop. And now we no longer have that loop over Markov chains. We now have that loop over electrons. And then when it comes to doing things like moving the electrons and computing the ratios, we do this for m independent Markov chains simultaneously. Right? So the, the function call, the bits of the code that handle this, know how to work on m walkers simultaneously. And then if we make m very large, perhaps thousands, that begins to get us the amount of parallelism we need to expose to the GPUs to go quickly. So this actually works uh, very well. 
Uh, we had it in what we call the legacy uh, CUDA code, and no one's really been able to do much to improve the performance uh, of that, actually, from any of the, any of the vendors, um, despite it being you know, sort of a decade old. So there were lots of good ideas in this. I seem to recall one of the issues with this whole scheme is that you have to warm up the, the Markov blocks before you start getting good statistics. Is that correct here or not? Uh, yes, it is. We have an equilibration period. I just want to see if I left the... Yeah, okay, this is actually shown here. So this is um, energy against time for a real run that we published. This is Vanadia, and this is maybe hard to spot at the back. There's an initial warm-up of a few hundred steps, which we don't include in our statistics, right? And then we start running and we averaging for the energy and other properties at that point. So does that warm-up time affect some of the choices you make, like how many walkers you choose per, per node and stuff like that? The warm-up time does not affect the mapping to the hardware, but it does affect the achievable efficiencies. Uh, because basically if you spend too much of your, if you spend a large fraction of your time doing warm-up and you need one step, for your statistics, then the actual production efficiency is quite low, and you should have run on less hardware. But that's actually very easy to plan for, but you do have to plan for it. So that's a different from deterministic methods. All right. So what's the new method? And this is this is our default now. Uh, and this essential realization we had was that making the largest chunk of work possible to throw on the GPUs. Would, could get us into trouble. Not because we wouldn't be filling the GPUs, but because as we grew that work, we would very likely also be growing some CPU work. Right? So this is a gaps theory that I'm gonna explain in this sketch in a moment. Uh, but the basic idea now is that we break up the walker population into a, a number of crowds, that's what we're calling them, and they're gonna map to, to threads, we might have four of these. Uh, for example, and this is going to let us better schedule the work. So, and it also does, does things like improve asynchronicity, and if we actually have a, now a, a large chunk of CPU work to do, perhaps a student has had a new idea that they, you know, they, they coded up and not ported to GPUs yet, we still want to be able to run quickly. All right, so how does the new scheme work? Um, let me start by saying you know, what the, sort of the old scheme was. This is sort of like a sketch, and it's definitely not to, to scale. So we have some sort of time axis. Uh, and in this example, we're going to have two kernels to run. Uh, we're going to evaluate some orbitals. And this is going to be a lot of work. So we're going to fill the GPU for some time with this. Then we always actually have a little bit of CPU work to perform, maybe some taking a sum for it, for, for example, um, before we can you know, shoot off another, another kernel to evaluate the determinants, for example, uh, in the update. And of course, the problem is, as we add more and more walkers, this gap can increase. In fact, it always does, right? And if we have a gap, that means the GPU is unlikely to be busy, and that's wasting the most expensive hardware. So what we do now is, is break this up into an, a number of crowds. Uh, and in this example, what we're, we're saying is that you know, this first operation, uh, maybe the, if you split it into three, the first two might be enough to, to fill the GPU. So this last third can't start running on the GPU until at least the first one is finished. Right? But once this first one is finished, it can start on its CPU work. Um, and now, actually, we don't have a gap, at least for this first one, because the kernel's running for this, this third crowd. And the upshot of this is that uh, if things are tuned appro appropriately for the hardware and that's being run on, we can get net higher throughput. Uh, and of course, if we choose just to use a single crowd, we recover the old GPU algorithm, which we already know is, is very efficient. So this can really only help. How does it perform? Uh, so these are some timings from uh, Summit. And this is our uh, canonical 120 atoms nickel oxide run, 1,500 electrons. And what I'm plotting here on the y-axis is sort of rate of work, normalized, so higher is better. Uh, and this x-axis is the total walk account on the GPU. So as I add more plots, the total work is going to be the same. So you can compare on the vertical axis. So this is one thread or one crowd, the old algorithm. You see that as we increase the batch size, we get more efficiency and more net throughput. This is on a per walker basis. Add uh, two through threads and you see we already 
get quite a nice improvement in efficiency, um, not maybe a factor of two or not quite that in that partic this particular case. And then if we move to, to four, we see how we have yet more improvement. And actually eight is actually too much on this particular machine. So this is more than doubled our throughput for this particular problem on this particular architecture. What about a larger system? So let's double the system size. Now, of course, we're cubic, so this is actually eight times the amount of work, and memory is also gone up with at least a square uh, in this case. So one thing to note is that the walk account only goes up to 24 on this. On the previous plot, we were in the hundreds. Again, it's, though it's a similar story. Uh, this is throughput. It's, it's less than on the previous slide. The black is the old algorithm, one, just sort of one thread here. Two or four gets us you know, 30 40% more throughput and four gets us a drop. And you can see we could probably keep going here if we had GPUs with more memory. So these are run on the GPUs on Summit, which have 16 gigs on them. And thankfully, the, the current generation, I can say, is sort of 64 or so. So that's performance on uh, NVIDIA uh, GPUs. Uh, you might be wondering, well, what about performance on other architectures? Is this going to work uh, everywhere? Well, it will. We're very confident in this, and we're swimming in performance data for every architecture right now. I'm going to show here one number, um, not from AMD, but actually from uh, Intel Ponte Vecchio. And they let us show one number uh, right now, so I can't say any more than, any more than this. Uh, and this is actually a number that was released at, at Supercomputing uh, last year. So this is the performance on the Ponte Vecchio GPUs um, with our standard production code. Uh, as compared with uh, an NVIDIA A100, and you see that it, here in this case it's actually getting higher uh, throughput. And you can infer from that uh, what you will. Question? Did you have to do any code tuning for this change in performance or throughput? Or is it the same code on both A100 and PVC? All right, it's a good, it's a good question. And actually, if you look in our source code, as, as you can, uh, what you'll see, and this could be a conversation afterwards the why we've done this, we are predominantly using OpenMP target offload, but the one place at the minute, and I would like to get rid of this, but the one place at the minute we have some more vendor-specific code is in the determinant update. That's where the leading term and the performance of the algorithm comes from, so we want to get every performance, we, all the performance we can there. And on Intel, that's written in sickle. Everywhere else, it's CUDA or HIP. So let me just summarize this. Uh, point. Uh, so this batching strategy uh, actually seems to be working really well. It's our default. We actually have a publication and proceedings uh, on this that goes into many more considerations and I can, can touch on uh, in this talk. And I just encourage you know, to think about can this be a, this idea of hiding the gaps by breaking up work to increase asynchronicity can be applied to your uh, applications. So just relying on one thread to, to spit out large amounts of work leads to some inefficiencies uh, at scale. Uh, we do have some outstanding topics, of course. In particular, we don't want users to have to find even more parameters to run the application. So when we have some more data, maybe we'll have a little performance model or some advisor in our workflow tool, uh, for example. And as we can discuss later, there's still lots of technical issues that need improving uh, on all these architectures. So now let me move to the... Uh, sort of the last part, very last part of the talk, which is not about going faster, it's about getting more accurate results in terms of reducing the fundamental approximations uh, in the method. And we're particularly interested in doing this in solids, of course, in materials. That's uh, partially, of course, where our funding comes from, but it's also where we don't have very good alternative methods, uh, for example, uh, to run. And one of the key things we actually want to remove here is what we generally call you know, the starting point dependence of the method. Because if we're post-processing a wave function from density functional theory, well, which functional did we start from uh, actually has an effect on the answers. It may be small, but it, it's certainly not non-zero. And if it's a case where DFT really fails, then we're going to need an independent uh, starting point. I should note that this independence has been achieved in small molecules for quite a while uh, now. And since we're mostly working on uh, improving uh, the diffusion Monte Carlo fixed energy, fixed node energy, our goal is really to improve the nodal surface of the wave function, the zeros. 
Um, some other methods, such as version of Monte Carlo, we'd have to improve the whole wave function as well. That's also wrong. So there's a few routes um, that are being pursued. Uh, so let me talk about this first one, which I have more to say on the next slide. And that is, well, we could still have a single determinant, for example, but why don't we optimize those orbitals fully within the quantum Monte Carlo in the presence of the correlation? And that's what we're going to be, to be doing. And the point here, of course, is that this is not exact, right? It's not going to give us an exact wave function, but it will give us something that's independent of starting point. And this has actually been done on and off for actually about 10 years, mainly by Sandro Sorella's group, who, of course, is going to be very sadly missed. Um, and they've tackled silicon, carbon, iron selenide, and a few other, few other systems working on this sort of orbital optimization. Uh, what's new here is that we were able to show improvement over other starting points, and that wasn't in the literature uh, before. Something which you have actually fully implemented in, in, in full production as an alternative route is to use configuration interaction methods, and we, we heard a, a little bit about those uh, earlier. Uh, and we have actually efficient algorithms to handle large numbers of determinants. So we have publications using a million determinants uh, in solids, uh, and so we have the can sort of completely sledgehammer simple solid systems now, and the workflow is fully there. So if one of you came to us and said, it's really important that we do a really accurate job of a particular material, you know, this method is actually available. Uh, we wouldn't like the cost, but you know, in principle, uh, that, that, that can, that can uh, be done. And so, of course, we're working on it, improving that. And of course, obviously, I can't touch on this talk, but there, touch on this in, in this talk, but there are other wave function forms that are, that are interesting. Uh, for example, you know, backflow, uh, geminals, and there's actually a, a new area that's developed over the last couple of years using techniques from machine learning and AI. This is sometimes called deep variational Monte Carlo. This is Fermi Nathan and so on to use the tools of machine learning to try and optimize or find a much more general form of the wave function and then map it to your system. And that really looks like variational Monte Carlo, uh, actually, at the end of the day. That's very promising. Uh, we'll see how far it gets in solids. Obviously, we're tracking this uh, very well, very closely. Now, why might we need to do this? So I want to show an example of a recent calculation. Uh, you know, it's up here on the archive where maybe things aren't going quite so well with our QMC calculations. And this is a calculation on terbium manganese 6 tin 6. It's one of these Kagome uh, compounds that were interested in one of these quantum materials. Uh, just as a reminder, terbium is, is over here in the lanthanides between gadolinium and dysprosium, so it's pretty heavy for us. We've done a lot of testing of the shooter potentials that we've made, and it actually looks, seems that terbium is just about as good as the other potentials we've made uh, recently and probably not the source of the issue that we find. And the problem is, our QMC results have a large overestimation of the magnetic moments in this system, and also the overall magnetization in the calculations. And it's actually both DFT and the QMC is pushing to much larger values in experiment. So in our current calculations, maybe double. So something very large is going wrong or going on in these systems, at least if we fully believe the experiments as well. I think we do. And just to show that here, this is diffusion Monte Carlo energy against total magnetization in our supercell, which we, of course we can choose. And since we have a variational method, we can generate the best wave function we can at each particular magnetization. And you know, we get this curve which says the magnetization would be up here. And if for these cells, if we believe the experiment, we should be over here. And you know, this is definitely much lower in energy, so you know, what, what's going on? Um, there are some mag other magnetic systems that have got some similar issues, at least in DFT, uh, as, what's been, um, as what we're seeing here, and you know, that maybe there is a connection that we can make. Uh, but clearly, we want to understand what's happening to, on the quantum Monte Carlo side, and then, you know, this is active research. So, you know, where are the possible sources of error? Well, one possibility, is, assuming no human error, is that we have some sort of technical thing going on in the treatment of metallic systems, or maybe the shooter potential, even though I said that we, we thought we were doing okay. That needs to be checked very carefully. There is also the possibility that there's some longer range magnetic structure needed to get this, this lower moment that's not included in any of the current calculations. 
But I think a good question that we all have to look at is, you know, what about the trial wave function? I think that's a fair question, whether you're in the community or outside the community. So obviously, we're looking at all of these. So we've done actually now this orbital optimization in at least a slightly simpler uh, material. And this is something which gives us a lot of optimism. So this is uh, orbital optimization in iron oxide. And I should point out, we didn't set out to do this orbital optimization work for this particular project. We were forced into it because we found out actually we did need to improve the trial wave function in this particular system. So what happens in iron oxide, at least experimentally, is that there's a small lattice distortion of a, a percent or two. And if we don't do this optimization, we don't recover that lattice distortion. And really, neither does anything else. It's very, very sensitive. So we have this issue with the distortion. Uh, so what are we going to do? Well, we optimize the, single, the orbitals in the single determinant. And essentially, we just take linear combinations of some set of orbitals coming from DFT. And if we do this for a large enough set, summing up enough empty states, and we can do this optimization, it, this should work, right? So this is about a 3,000 parameter optimization. This is a large scale stochastic optimization, which is not straightforward. Uh, and we do our final diffusion Monte Carlo in you know, a reasonably large cell with 1,200 electrons. These are not small runs in, small prim in toy primitive cells. In addition to doing this orbital optimization work, we tried a few other sources of trial wave function as well. So let me just explain what we have. So here on the right, this is the result from diffusion Monte Carlo. Uh, vertical is en the energy, and lower is better, as we have a variational method. And what we're doing here is we, we have wave functions starting from PBE, DFT, and also wave functions starting from PBE plus U, DFT. And of course, the goal would be to arrive at the same point. So if we start with the current, the standard method with no optimization, we get these results here. We also made the best multi-determinant wave function we could. This was sort of done by hand. It doesn't use all the modern technology. Um, this didn't really help improve the nodal surface very much. Uh, we then used backflow wave functions. This is Feynman backflow, uh, which certainly have been shown to help in solids in the past. And we do get slightly lower energies here, but this also didn't fix uh, the problem. Uh, and then when we do this orbital optimization shown here, uh, the thing to note is that whether we start with PBE or PBE plus U, we have the same energy within arrow bars. Right? So this is independence of the starting point. And then in addition, when we look at the spin densities that come out as well, the only calculation that gets the same spin densities for both routes is this full orbital optimization route. So now we have energies and densities independent of starting point uh, in the solid. Is that orbital optimization on a single determinant? Yes. Okay, and then no backflow either. So okay. These are all separate. If you could combine them, right? Yes, we could make steadily more sophisticated. And the backflow, back for example, you could easily add on now, right? I might quite, you said we could possibly add it on straight easily. I, I might question how easy it is to do that because it adds to the cost quite extensively. But yes, in principle, these can all be combined. So actually, long term, this is getting slightly ahead. We would envisage doing orbital optimization and CI all at the same time. Yeah. Um, so this actually, to me, was a very surprising result. Um, I should add that we, we do agree with experimental lattice distortion at the end of the day. But this actually has, um, it turned out that one of the more simpler wave functions gave us the most accurate results. So a single determinant of optimized orbitals is much cheaper than backflow to run, for example. Uh, now, what are the challenges here? And this is where I basically state the problem. Uh, unfortunately, I can't go into the details. Uh, and as a little, I need to make a little caveat here. Um, you know, in the field, we don't yet have you know, systematic comparisons of different optimization schemes and different wave functions. So there's a lot of hand waving that's going on and impressions that are being passed around in the community. And we're going to have to find a way of formalizing this uh, in some way. Uh, so what's the problem? Stochastic optimization of these wave functions is very, very delicate. Uh, you might think if we have a large number of coefficients in the wave function, and some of them might be maybe near an atomic core, for example. So a small change could give a huge change in their kinetic energy. Others might be a long, long, long way out uh, from an atomic core, for example, where there's not much electron density. 
giving a much weaker dependence on the energy. And so this is a hard task for any optimization scheme. So essentially what's done is to just sledgehammer these systems with a large number of statistics. And when I look through the literature, sort of the state of the art has been around 10,000 coefficients, that order of magnitude, for quite a few years now. You know, it's not a million. We can argue if it's 20,000 or 30,000 or, or 5,000, but it is not millions. And clearly we want to push uh, in that direction. So we need to have something that's more sophisticated. Uh, and the optimization schemes uh, clearly need to be much more statistically aware, factoring all the uncertainties. And essentially, the optimizers that have been used so far don't fully do that. I do want, so help is wanted here, if there are any experts in stochastic optimization. I would certainly like to have a, a discussion. Uh, I do want to point out some progress done by um, Eric Neuskerman's group uh, at Berkeley. Uh, this is actually done by um, Leon Otis, who I think has moved to Chicago uh, recently. Uh, and they work on molecular systems, but importantly, looking at excited states of molecules, which are also tricky. Uh, and they have a scheme which they call adaptive step control, which essentially one can think of as having a trust radius uh, in the optimization. And what they show in the table of contents figure for this paper, you know, this is energy against optimization. Uh, you know, the, the old schemes, which are still state of the art, when you start doing orbital optimization, you can run into instabilities. And when these algorithms fail, you take a step which worsens the wave function and you get higher energy. So you would probably restart it at some point. But then in the new algorithm, it's much more stable. So that helps, but clearly we need uh, much more. So I think I'm pretty much uh, on time here. So let me just move to the uh, conclusions. Uh, I've shown you, you know, we've got these new numerical methods and GPU-aware algorithms that really deliver large speed-ups. And importantly, they deliver large speed-ups for problems of sizes that we actually care about, right? Not just some stunt-sized calculation that we're going to run uh, once. And then we and also the, you know, the community in general are working on this uh, starting point dependence, independence, which we're starting to see more of. And that's also clearly critical to the, you know, the long-term uh, impact of the method. And as you can probably tell, we're really optimistic to apply these you know, widely to materials with elements from all over the periodic table. So on that note, thanks very much for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions.